This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. If I'm offered an opportunity to interview an author and the title of his book is Fluke, Chance, Chaos, and Why Everything We Do Matters, I'm in. I'm all in. My guest today is Brian Kloss, and we dive into this very idea of fluke, the random, unpredictable, chaotic event, choice, decision, who knows what, and how it shapes us all. Not only that, our own choices. Our own choices are constantly shaping us, our family's choices. So many different issues, but it all weaves in to an interesting bit of insight. Without any further delay from me, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Brian Kloss. I love the premise. I'll share something really quick about how I typically do these. I often find just having a conversation is the best way. And I'm going to bring up many topics and ideas in the book. And it usually just works great like that. My thinking is, is your premise of getting people to, if you're on the elevator with someone, you're bringing them into the idea of like, hey, rewind your life, play it over again. Do you think it would play out like it's played out so far? The obvious answer for me is no. The chances of it playing out exactly the same, or I would think zero. Because there's too many choices, too many decisions, too many things happened to me along the way that were perhaps unpredictable. There's chance. But then on the flip side of that, too, there could be, you know, okay, I was a guy growing up in suburban Virginia outside D.C. For many people that go down that track, they don't end up in Saigon. They're probably working for the government, living around the D.C. area, that kind of thing. So there are these small decisions and chances and things that can happen that can affect our life direction. But then there's also perhaps a larger trend that exists for many people. Most people are probably going to have a pretty normal life. They're going to have kids. They're going to work a job. And when they leave, their biggest dent they might leave on society are their kids. They might not be out there writing books or making pronouncements or getting into the fight, so to speak. Is that a fair kind of look at how you see things? I think that the world exists basically somewhere between order and disorder, which is what you're touching on. And there's a lot of regularity and patterns in life. And I think this seduces us into thinking the small stuff doesn't matter, that it gets written out. When it comes to things like economics and forecasting, I think this is where we have models that reflect that world back at us. X causes Y. Here's a linear relationship. This is how the world works. My argument is that when you look closely at how the world actually works, all of that falls apart very, very quickly. The opening story in the book I touch on from a personal basis is about this mass murder that happens in Wisconsin in 1905, where a woman snaps basically after having four children, and her husband comes home and sees that she's killed all of the kids and then killed herself. And the reason I mention this is because this is my great grandfather's first wife. He remarried to my great grandmother, and that's why I exist. One of the things that is quite obvious to me is not only do I only exist because of this mass murder, but you're only listening to my voice because four kids were killed in Wisconsin in 1905. When you start to think about the world that way, where the decisions of people in the distant past shape the ways that our world operates today, it starts to become apparent that every little thing is interconnected. To me, there's this disconnect between the model version of the world there's this neat and tidy sort of version of reality and the actual version of the world where our lives are endlessly diverted by decisions that we don't even know are significant. The argument is effectively that the arbitrary and the accidental play a much bigger role in our lives. I think some of the time we recognize that, like when you choose where to go to university, it's obvious that you're making a big choice or when you choose who to get married to or whatever. But there's all sorts of stuff. There's just these hidden variables that are constantly diverting us. And that's one of the core ideas of the book, where I think we really delude ourselves into this idea of separable reality with neat and tidy models and linear relationships, when in fact, tiny changes can have really profound effects on the world. I know you're a guy that's on X, formerly Twitter. We can see in the last, I guess the last week with the three college presidents showing up before Congress, all of a sudden this conversation of, for example, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a big topic. 
So I was thinking about that as you just brought up making a choice to go to college. I have a nephew who had a chance to go and play sports at several of the Ivy Leagues. He ended up at the University of Virginia. At this point in time right now, I'm sort of happy for him for that. You're right. You make the choice about what college you're going to go to. A lot of the people that I see on X, and this could be from the left and the right, that are unhappy about the three college presidents, you could have made the choice to go to an Ivy in the 1980s or the 1990s. And making that choice today, you're going to have an entirely different experience. The argument that I'm making in the book goes a little bit beyond that, I think, because those are the things that people accept. People accept that these choices that are big and obvious are going to have big and obvious consequences. No one believes when they're deciding where to go to undergrad that it's going to have no effect on their life. It's just so obvious. But I think what we're not paying attention to are sort of the invisible aspects of our lives that divert them all the time. Up until I was 20 years old, to go back to this sort of macabre story from my own life, up until I was 20 years old, I didn't know about this story. So I had no idea that my existence was predicated on a mass murder. That's a quite extreme version, but there's all sorts of things where people make little decisions about what to say in a conversation or what not to say. And it has these tentacles that then affect you later on in life. And I think there's a lot of realms of science, for example, where this idea is taken really seriously, whether it's chaos theory or evolutionary biology, where there's this whole debate between the sort of ordered trajectory of evolution versus randomness that comes from, for example, an asteroid walloping the earth and knocking out the dinosaurs and giving rise to mammals and eventually us. That, I think, is not taken as seriously in social science because it's really hard to model that stuff. When we think about things like the black swan and these sorts of ideas from Nassim Nicholas Taleb, there's sort of this concept in the world now that suggests that these are sort of aberrations. Every so often, this sort of freak accident happens. And my argument is, no, this is the inevitable consequence of a super interconnected world where chaos theory actually does dictate cause and effect. When I was taught how to look at the world as a social scientist, it was basically write all that stuff out because that's the noise. What I'm basically saying is ignoring the noise at your peril is a very stupid thing to do because as you rightly describe, your nephew, he understands that this is going to be a different experience than he would have had had he gone to the Ivy Leagues. But what about just who his roommate is? That's going to affect his life or whether he decides to go to a first meeting for a sports organization or not. I mean, all these things have reverberations that may change the trajectory of his life based on who he meets, what he says at those meetings, etc. And I think when you take that seriously in your own life, it changes the way you see the world. When you take it seriously in social science and economic forecasting and so on, it makes you much more prone to understanding that there's a lot less control than we think we have. And I think that's one of the main takeaways from the book as well is that this is something where the sort of funhouse mirror version of the world that we see in models is very much not the world why we keep getting surprised by these sort of unpredicted events is because we have a fundamentally incorrect lens in how we understand cause and effect in social relationships. You might enjoy this little nugget. You might not be aware of this. So I've written eight books about a particular trading strategy. And that particular trading strategy is based off essentially making big money when crisis events or black swans happen. There is no predictive element to it. It's basically a strategy, kind of like venture capital, where you're taking small bets across a wide cross-section of markets, and you don't know what's going to happen at all. You have no prediction at all as to what's going to happen. But if you just crunch the math, you end up with a positive mathematical expectation across a portfolio. You make bets, and then the next thing you know, maybe uh, long-term capital management blows up in 98. The last couple of years, all kinds of events. COVID in March of 2020. I'm very used to what you're saying. Now, the interesting thing when you brought up Talib and the Black Swans, there's no way to predict this stuff. I find in my world, there's so many people that go on YouTube and they play around, they see some charting or something, they see a pattern. And if they follow that pattern on the chart, the market will do this next. Well, that's just all a bunch of bunk. It really is what Talib has said. You can't predict these damn things. But when they happen, it's a big, big event. To also add to the interconnected part of it, the reason that a particular strategy like I'm involved with, and I'm only bringing this up because you just walked right into it. It's like I'm in the middle of thinking about this all the time. If you're trading this diversified group of futures markets, and let's say something happens in the normal world, well, somebody blows up. Well, if you're trading all these different futures markets, they all start racing. Now, you don't know why they're racing, but you've got positions. So you start to make money when the rest of the world 
who's not thinking about this interconnected aspect of everything. They just kind of like, okay, my gosh, my equities, my buy and hold mutual fund is crashing, but I'm very used to the mentality you're talking about. I didn't know if you're aware of that. I mean, it's a perfect coordination between our ideas, I think, because this is something where one of the main arguments I'm bringing out in the book is that there's a failing in social research, and this is economics, my own field of political science, et cetera, to take the ideas seriously that you're describing of the sort of unpredictability of the world. But there's not a failing to take this seriously in harder sciences. There's this world of science called complex systems theory, which I'm sure you're aware of. And it's something where what I talk about is this thing that a physicist came up with in the 1980s called the sand pile model. And it speaks to the description of you of what you said on YouTube, where you see this trend, or you see this linear relationship, and you assume it's going to continue. The sand pile model basically says, look, if you add grains of sand into a pile, eventually it's going to have an avalanche. And this is extremely likely. It's inevitable, in fact. But you don't know which grain of sand is going to cause the avalanche. Now, which one contributed to the avalanche? The answer is everyone, because without all of them, you wouldn't have had the collapse. And so it's a mentality shift. It's going from thinking about one grain of sand as the, oh, the trigger or the black swan or the sort of diversion that causes everything to have a dislocation to an expectation that if you create systems that are hyper interconnected, extremely optimized for efficiency, ever increasing the sand pile, there's going to be collapses. There's a few lessons. One is about that unpredictability and sort of the naivety of linear models, which as a social scientist, it is so depressing how many people still use simple linear regressions to explain an unbelievably complex, interconnected world of 8 billion interacting people. In addition to that, it's thinking, okay, hold on, we've designed systems that guarantee the avalanche. So maybe we need to have a bit more resilience, a bit more slack, and so on. Now, whether you can make more money in the sand pile model, I mean, I'm a political scientist, that's not my remit to tell you how to invest. But it is something where I think this is potentially bad for society to have hyper optimization and always living on what physicists call the edge of chaos. Going in the direction that you're going, I started thinking about the big short movie. During that time, I'm sure you've seen it, that time period, that 08, 09 time period, and we think back to the movie with Christian Bale and all that kind of stuff, playing Michael Burry. And that movie was all about the people that figured it out. They had the foresight. They somehow or another, they figured out what was going on, and then they bet. But then there's a whole group of other people, like in my world, that had no clue when the markets were moving, they went long or short across a broad cross section of markets. And when it was all said and done, they made the same amount of money, but they had no earthly idea about what was going to happen, why it was happening or anything. So it's really interesting. And that doesn't make an interesting movie. And I think what you were describing in your investing strategy also reflects some of the core ideas that I talk about in areas of what Mervyn King calls, the former governor of the Bank of England calls radical uncertainty, which is moments where Unlike in the example from the big short, there are a lot of areas where literally no one could possibly predict something. And probabilistic forecasting is actually meaningless. The example they give in their book, it's called Radical Uncertainty, is the bin Laden raid that happened during Obama's presidency, where they were giving probabilistic forecasts based on confidence estimates of intelligence, where they'd say, we think there's a 60% probability that he's there, Mr. President, because you know, they didn't know whether bin Laden was actually in the compound. They'd say, oh, we have an 80% probability of success in this raid. I mean, these are subjective Bayesian assessments. They're not rooted in any numbers. They're just completely subjective measures of confidence. And so in those moments, one of the things that they say is like, if you mistake a radical uncertainty moment for one in which you can navigate a moment through probabilistic forecasting, you're going to make huge mistakes. But also in moments where you have absolutely no idea what to do, one of the things that's a wise investing strategy possibly, or also just a navigation strategy for life my grandfather's advice to me was a successful life is made by avoiding catastrophe. Those were his, his words of wisdom. And I think one of the ways to do that is through experimentation. And this is where I try to synthesize some of the ideas from evolutionary biology with those of social systems, because the wisdom of evolution is from undirected experimentation through moments of extreme change and upheaval, where the environment shifts and organisms just experiment. They hone unbelievable capabilities and solve problems in ways that are very unexpected, but end up working really well. I think this provides some lessons for us where I try to draw how, if you know that something is a constrained closed system with highly regular patterns, ordered systems, et cetera, and a linear relationship actually makes sense. There's a lot of those. Sports are one of those, right? Moneyballing works because it's the same season with the same teams, with the same rules over and over and over. So you have a system that is artificially created to be stable. 
yeah, moneyball the hell out of that. It makes total sense. But there's so much of the world that is radical uncertainty that if you mistake it for moneyballing a world of extreme chaos, you're going to get blindsided over and over. And some of the time you might make some very big bets that pay off. Over the long run, I think it's a very poor idea to sort of put your eggs in the basket of certainty in what I think is a fundamentally uncertain world because of things like chaos theory. I'm pretty sure that you took a dig at his research. I know I did in my 2017 edition of my first book, which was Nate Silver over the elections. I just found it fascinating. I mean, look, I'm sure he's a brilliant guy. I've never met him or anything. I've not interviewed him. I can't listen to these types of forecasts. I can't listen to these types of models because it was like Nate was so accurate. He's so accurate. And then he got 2016 very wrong. And then people are surprised. And they're surprised because they're looking at the world in a fundamentally messed up way. It's not so orderly and neat. And the surprises happen. The problem with Nate Silver that I take issue with in Fluke is that he's developed a system of presenting himself as a forecasting guru with models that are unfalsifiable. You can't be wrong when you have a 71.4% chance that Hillary Clinton wins and she doesn't. And your answer to that is, well, it wasn't 100%. It's like, okay, then unless you have a 100% model, you're never wrong because you can always say, oh, something weird. Real quick though, the 71%, I'm sure there's a model that spit that out. But common sense, even for just a young kid that doesn't know anything, where the hell did that 71% come from? And why is it any more accurate than 73 or 65? And it seems like it's all just pulled out of thin air. It is essentially pulled out of thin air. And I'm not saying he doesn't have some complex model, but it's the wrong way to look at the world. The problem to me is that those models, they end up trying to sort of condense what is ultimately a common sense problem into a number. And the common sense problem was that everyone knew in 2016, if you were looking at the polls and you weren't looking at potentially the media coverage of the polls, it was clear it was going to be a close election. The polling averages were showing Clinton in the lead marginally because of the Electoral College. Anyone who understood how the system worked, I mean, a three-point lead was not going to be a massive lead. And she ended up winning the popular vote by 3%, and she ended up losing the Electoral College. And to me, there's a sort of divide in the way we think about the world and forecasts between this sort of extreme technical application. And this is where my own field of political science and also quantitative economics ends up producing models. They're prone to what the economist Paul Romer calls mathiness, which is where you obscure what is ultimately a common sense, logical way of viewing the world, which is to say something like, this is going to be a close election and we don't really know what's going to happen into such an ornate level of equations and Monte Carlo simulations and so on that you give the veneer of certainty which is way more dangerous than just saying we don't know. And the right way to forecast 2016, as well as, by the way, the right way to forecast 2024 for me, is to say we don't know, because we don't. The reason we don't know is because the data that's relevant goes all the way up to the last day of the election. If there's a bombshell story that breaks the day before the vote, that changes the model, and there's going to be no way to factor that in. This is exactly what happened in 2016. You had a renewed investigation into Hillary Clinton from the FBI. There was hacking. All these things sway the polls a little bit and sway the outcome a little bit. And they're not factored in because they're late breaking news. The big problem, though, that I find with this is that because we don't talk in ways that are precise for the general public, a lot of people just think, oh, these people have no idea about the world because they have presented a false level of certainty. And there's some problems, by the way, that we have to use models to choose how to do things because there's no alternative. If you're deciding how to allocate a healthcare budget in this fiscal year, yeah, use the models and Bayesian inference, even if they're flawed, because you've got to choose. You have to make a choice. It's the same way that like, you have to decide how to treat a cancer patient. That kind of question requires an answer. So saying, I don't know, is not a choice. But there's loads of questions in the world that we force ourselves to forecast for no reason. Like, Why do we need to say what we think Burundi's growth rate will be in 2030? Because we have no idea. It's obviously absurd. Like The pandemic or 9-11, or any of these other things, the financial crisis, all of those obliterated the long-term forecasts in a second, and they keep happening. We keep getting super wrong about stuff, and yet we make these extremely hubristic forecasts long into the future. I'm going to jump back to politics in a second. I got to say this, though, really quick. One of my favorites in the last handful of years are the live sporting events, and specifically, I'll see this on ESPN. I think I did this during the New England Patriots, Atlanta Falcons 
Super Bowl. I think I was taking screenshots and there was an NCAA championship game, maybe with UVA too. I did the same thing where you watch first quarter, whatever the team scores and oh, this team's got a 75% chance of winning. And this thing goes on the whole way. And then I've seen the two that I just mentioned, I think were pretty much the one team, whatever it was, the one team was they're gonna, 99% chance they're going to win. And then some fluke happens and they don't. Maybe there's some betting reason that there's a way to sneak money from people in the gambling world or something. But the idea that one is going to follow updated odds for a sporting event, I think, gets right at the heart of where you're going to, which just seems pointless to me. In terms of accuracy, I have slightly less of a problem with sporting events just because they are more probabilistic. They're closer to coin flips than presidential elections just because there's so many of them. So you can have frequentist probabilities where you look at this and sort of get some idea. But yes, of course, you're right that like loads of the time, A, they're wrong. And B, and I think this is more important, that's not what sports are for. Maybe people bet on them and they like that and so on. But like sports are for entertainment. They're for excitement. And I think when you have a lot of realms of the world that get distilled into these extremely detailed models, it sucks the joy out of some of the uncertainty. I think uncertainty is actually a relatively good thing in some contexts, like in sports. The other thing I'd say about sports that's interesting, and this is one of the other ideas I try to explore more in one of the chapters, we're really swayed by narratives and stories. You really latch onto them. And I think whenever you see sports punditry during the game, where people are sort of weighing in on this, it's all about the narrative arc of the come from behind victory and so on. And that's how we see a lot of the world. And I think one of the things that this then does bleed into the world of economics and other sorts of forecasting is Robert Schiller later won a Nobel Prize in economics. He has this book on narrative economics. What he shows is that you can have all the models you want, but humans are fundamentally storytelling animals. And when we get a good narrative, we latch onto it. And that matters because the narratives are causal. They drive us to act. They cause us to do things differently when we have stories that we believe in. You see this in all sorts of things where people infer backwards in the data Anytime you hear that markets are reacting to, and then there's one explanation for the entire stock market. I mean, it's just BS. Nonstop BS, 24 and 7 every day of the week for decades. (laughs) Yeah. And it's ubiquitous. The thing that's so bizarre to me is no one ends up producing a shift in this. And this is where I'm trying to blend some of the lessons of science with those of social science. And one of the core lessons of science is that when you have falsifiability, when you can disprove something, you make progress. And you have economics models, like zombie economics models that have been wrong for decades. There's a study I cite in the book where they looked at the IMF's forecast of recessions, and they got precisely zero right, right, in this period. They never got it right. And they're still the same models used to forecast recessions today, even though they never work. Whereas like in physics, you're off by like one-tenth of 1% in one measure, and the entire theory is obliterated. Trying to get ourselves towards a world where people have to make firm predictions isn't going to work. We live in an unpredictable world, but it will make us better. And I think this is where some of the forecasting stuff with firm predictions can be iteratively improved because this is where Nate Silver needs to go away from 71.4% to saying, I think this person will win because then we can prove who's right and who's wrong. You know this. There's such a problem here to convince people that that story that Nate is giving, I've got this science down. I've got this math down. People love that shit. They just want to hear that. They soak that up. Me and perhaps you are up against a mountain of folks that don't really look at the world this way. They're getting their messaging from big, big messaging centers, media centers, and it's very difficult to break through. Well, I think this is also one of the things where the philosophy of uncertainty is so important for people to understand. Because we live in a world that is chaotic, it's uncertain, it has the veneer of order, but then everything blows apart. And when you add to that the 71.4% model of an election, you give people the false sense of certainty, which is actually dangerous. It's not that I have a problem with Nate Silver like on a personal level or anything like that. I think that actually what is happening is condensing reality into these seemingly certain mathematical models of the world gives people such a sense of hubris that they make mistakes. And it makes catastrophic risk much more likely and much more prominent. I think a healthy dose of uncertainty and just saying we don't know a lot more often is really good for society. And we have developed systems where that is actually bad for you. And I say personally, like on a sort of career basis, I get invited sometimes to go on TV to talk about politics. You get asked all these questions, why is this happening? The honest answer is sometimes like, I don't know. 
we live in a super, super complex world, but you can't go on CNN and say, I don't know, because you look like an idiot. It's sort of an adjustment of actually wisdom lies in acknowledging radical uncertainty where it exists. Stupidity lies in the hubris of condensing that world into a 71.4% model when the real answer is, I don't know. We would be better off as societies if we parceled out some of the questions that don't need to be answered urgently and just said, we don't know. We don't understand them. And science does this much better, I think, than a lot of the other areas of social realms, because there's so many things where scientists just don't know and they acknowledge it and it's okay. Let me bring up a controversial one. Maybe it's not controversial. Maybe you're going to sway me to some perspective that I'm not thinking about. But I think we touched on it just briefly, the 2016 election. But if we just go straight to Trump, is Trump a fluke? Is Trump's rise and is Trump's win a fluke from your perspective as how you're trying to map these things out? Just also for a little bit of background too, I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that you made the case as a political science major myself, I'm getting into your poli sci a little bit here. You made the case that Trump was probably the wedge that divided the Republican Party. So three different things I'm putting on your plate. The idea was the rise of Trump, a fluke, was his election a fluke, and bringing in this side element of him potentially dividing the Republican Party. Again, this is the story of partway between chaos and disorder. Trump first off, I mean, you can trace back to his childhood, some of the motivations for why he might want to prove haters wrong. And so, I mean, all of these things are flukes that could have unfolded differently. Anytime you look at someone's life, there are infinite possible trajectories. And the actual trajectory is basically an infinitesimal likelihood because everything else could have gone differently. In the broad sense, yes. In the more direct sense, there's a story which may or may not be true. It's something that we'll never know unless we were to get inside Trump's head. But there was an event in 2011. I was just mentioning the bin Laden raid. One of the things that's truly amazing about that moment, not just the radical uncertainty around it, was that Right before Barack Obama authorized the raid to kill Osama bin Laden, he basically did stand-up comedy at the White House Correspondents' Dinner that same night. It was like two hours before it. In that event, Donald Trump was at one of the main tables. The punchline of about three or four of Obama's jokes were all about Donald Trump. He said something to the effect of, he'll never get elected, something like that. Well, it's not just that he'll never get elected. He says, I'm kept up at night. He says, I can't imagine being Donald Trump because he has to deal with the really hard decisions like who to fire on Celebrity Apprentice, whereas I'm you know, dealing with much easier stuff. And it's ribbing him as saying you're a lightweight. There are reports, again, I can't get inside Trump's psychology for sure, but there's reports that Trump decided to run for president that night to show Obama that he wasn't a lightweight. Now, if you think about that in the sense of a fluke in the argument I'm making, the joke writer possibly caused Trump as the president. Because if the joke writer had come up with a different joke or they'd taken it in a different direction or Trump had been sick, maybe he doesn't decide to run for president. It's totally plausible because he was an influential figure in the Republican Party. There's a lot of things that went wrong for him personally after he's run for president and so on. I can't say that that counterfactual is guaranteed. Every single layer of any sort of political outcome, it could have been otherwise. And I think that's something where the aspects of this extremely complex world It's also the timing of the election. I mean, if it had been two weeks earlier, two weeks later, he might have lost. If there had been different weather in certain swing states, he might have lost. Anytime you have a close outcome and you start to look for those sort of aberrations, those arbitrary and accidental causes, there's an enormous number of them. And that's where I think, again, it's a philosophical viewpoint. That is to say, there's a certain fragility to the world, even if it appears regular and ordered and stable to us. Let me throw one out. In the same headspace of Trump, this is my perspective in thinking about our conversations today. I was thinking, how did we get Trump? And so I take myself back. I was born in 68. I take myself back to really starting to watch politics for that 1980 election. The GOP favored and preferred candidate before the primaries was not Reagan. It was Bush. Reagan was not expected to be Bush. They start the primaries. Reagan gets it. Reagan's there for eight years. Then Bush comes in because people felt the economy was really great and everything. Then Bush came in and we start to talk about flukes. Well, okay. The only reason Bill Clinton, from my perspective, got elected is because when he decided to run, he was not a first tier or even a second tier Democrat. Bush had like a 92% approval rating. Who's going to run against this president with a 92% approval rating? But then Bush said something about taxes and 
that wasn't true or even, you know, he kind of lied about it. He wasn't going to raise them. And then wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Things flipped. The economy went bad. Clinton's standing there at the right time at the right place. The case I'm making here, though, too, is when I think about this split in the Republican Party, I'm, I'm thinking about the flukes that have happened because you would have said, OK, Reagan was a more kind of conservative guy and Bush was more of a, let's be frank, more of a deep state GOP moderate kind of guy. Then you get a war under the first Bush. Then you get a war under the second Bush. You've got this thing building up in the Republican Party that people might not have been paying attention to in terms of the polls. But I think the people, they're seeing these things happening. When a guy like Trump appears, there's probably a lot of other big talking conservative guys that perhaps could have run. But if we think back to that moment where Trump essentially won the election making fun of Rosie O'Donnell, that moment, he looked like he was bigger. All these things are connected in a way. This is kind of what you're talking about in your book. All these events that appear random actually all feel connected to me. How do you feel about that kind of a story? I mean, ultimately, I think Trump was at the right place at the right time, like Bill Clinton was at the right place at the right time. And things have been happening behind the scenes that the polls weren't reflecting. And then people had a chance to choose, oh, my gosh, I'm going to pick the wrecking ball, Trump. That's who I want. I want the wrecking ball in there. Wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am. Here we are. I agree with this viewpoint completely, because it's something where every time that you look at political events, and this can be the rise of Trump, or as I'll explain in a second, the sort of first Gulf War that you described with George H.W. Bush, every time you think about it from like the political science perspective, it's all these sort of constrained institutions, and here's this neat narrative of X to Y and so on. The first Gulf War had reverberations, George H.W. Bush's presidency and so on. And then, of course, it has reverberations in the second Gulf War, 2003, which has reverberations in the financial crisis because of the fiscal state of the country and so on. When you look at how the first Gulf War started, Saddam Hussein got two messages from the White House. One of them was delivered in person by the U.S. diplomat, and one of them was a written document. And they provided different conceptions of how seriously the U.S. was going to take a prospective invasion of Kuwait. One of them said, basically, don't do it. And the other one said, don't do it or will attack you. Saddam Hussein believed that the real message, he miscalculated, he believed the real message was, we strongly urge you not to do this, but there will be no consequences. And that's why he invaded Kuwait. So you think about all these reverberations in US presidential history and the US economy and all these other things that come out of this, it's one dictator's miscalculation of trying to understand two conflicting messages. And this is how the world works. I mean, we just pretend it doesn't. I know I'm bringing up science a bit in a politics podcast, an economics podcast, and so on. One of the things that I think is worth thinking about that's a really nice framework for thinking about how human choices manifest in different ways is this divide in evolutionary theory between contingency and convergence. And it's between chaos and order. So contingency is like just random stuff happens. So an asteroid hits and like everything changes. But convergence is really interesting because it shows if you look at our eyes and you look at octopus eyes, they're basically the same because the world had this problem of how to see even though there's 500 million years of different lineages between octopus and humans, it just solved the problem in the same way. It provided order to it. Our world is halfway between those two. Every once in a while, there's these little flukes that just blow everything up. And the rest of the world is different. History unfolds completely differently because of those. Other things are based on trends and predictable relationships and patterns. And this is where when you try to describe Trump's rise, there is a sort of trend here. You have the anti-immigration rising in the Republican Party. You have Trump tapping into that. You have the sort of anti-elite backlash that Trump really masterfully tapped into, even though he's quite clearly an elite. He really was effective at presenting himself as the anti-elite. That's the sort of mixture of the story. There's a through line that you can draw for Trump that is based on all these little tiny decisions, the joke at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, the backlash to Iraq, et cetera, et cetera, but also these long-term trends. Let me take you to another example that I think is kind of interesting because I think it's the perhaps fluke events that happen, but then the longer term trend behind the scenes. So we can all think back to Eisenhower's military industrial speech, again, as a kid who grew up in the D.C. area. So here we get a president elected in what, 1960 JFK. And I think generally, you know, even though it was a close election, I think America felt the Cuban Missile Crisis was not great and all that kind of stuff. But I think generally... Uh, people had an okay feeling about him. Now, you know the politics of this. He probably did not want to have LBJ as his vice president, but hey, you got to win elections and LBJ is bringing the South. So there you go. So JFK gets killed, LBJ comes in. What's really interesting about that from my perspective is like, okay, Democratic president can make choices and makes the choice to go into a war that 
We had to go into, supposedly, we had to go into that war because if not, domino theory. Here we are in 2023. If we don't go into Ukraine, it's domino theory, again, with a Democratic president. Now, what's interesting about both of those two, and this also, I think, the through line doesn't disconnect with both Bushes going to war. So here's these random things that happen. JFK gets killed. LBJ comes in. And look, if LBJ did not go into Vietnam, he probably would have had two terms and would have just been the 60s. People were making money. It would have been a completely different thing if he didn't make the choice to ramp it up in Vietnam. The through line behind all of this, perhaps the deeper issue, like, yes, we have the frontline presidents making decisions that definitely affecting the world and America, but also behind the scenes, there were defense contractors that have made the area that I grew up super wealthy and they don't go away whether the president's there or not and they get bigger and they get bigger and they get bigger and they like these conflicts because there's a lot of money to be made so it is quite interesting that there is this disorder perhaps with the presidential choices and the presidential decisions but then there's the order behind the scenes that i might argue is always there which is the big money that has their goals and desires too yeah, I mean, I think that's a perfect encapsulation of why we get this sort of hubristic sense that there is regularity and patterns, because there is order. One of the things that I sort of mentioned, I think this is something where it has a relevance to exactly what you're describing, these larger forces around politics, but tied in with the stochastic events like JFK's assassination. We built a society where so much of our daily life is ordered. Starbucks doesn't change. Starbucks is the same everywhere. You go there, it's got the same menu. It's got the same service, et cetera. You can expect it's very solid. But the superstructure of our societies does get massive shocks. You have pandemics, you have wars, you have constant collapse that blindsides us. We still believe in this idea because of our daily existence, having this regularity, that the larger forces are what to pay attention to. This is where I find, I mean, I have a real problem with the signal versus noise. I'm not trying to really bash Nate Silver here. but like, Poor Nate. <laughs> I have a problem with that framing because I think that when you look at history and when you look at shocks. The noise is what's causing them. The reason I say that is because you have these little tiny things that manifest themselves in a much bigger way. That's what nonlinear systems are. And you can't anticipate them. One of my favorite stories in the book, the one I opened the book with, is about how the atomic bomb ends up getting dropped on the places it does. And the story starts in 1926 with a vacation in Kyoto, Japan, for a couple who's off on a vacation. It turns out that 19 years later, the husband of the couple is this America's Secretary of War, Henry Stimson. The generals all say we got to bomb Kyoto because Kyoto is full of airplane manufacturing sites. It's a, it's a part of the Japanese war machine now. So they unanimously say Kyoto's top target. Twice, this again goes back to the presidential decision making you reference. Twice, Stimson, the Secretary of War, has meetings with Truman and basically threatens to resign if he doesn't take Kyoto off the list. And that's the reason why Hiroshima gets bombed. Every single anticipation of larger forces and so on would think about the rational choices, the rational assessment of targeting decisions and so on. In that moment, the only thing that mattered was where this guy vacationed in 1926 and the fact that his wife really liked Kyoto. When you start to think about the world that way, you have a much healthier dose of appreciating the chaos for what it is and not simply thinking, oh, these larger forces will dictate everything in the end. And I think that's the narrative that prevails in modern society. It makes me think about something, too, that people don't necessarily think about. And I'm not trying to pick a side here. Sometimes in America, in particular, when we hear about indictments or we hear about DAs or this or that or whatever, and we like to think, oh, it's just all the law. Well, just like you made the case that somebody vacationed in Kyoto, and look, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm happy you made the decision because that golden temple in Kyoto is amazing. But personal grievances can exist in the legal system. I mean, there's all kinds of things that people don't properly see. It's not all logic. It's not all a straight line. There's stuff. It's just the way it happens. I particularly appreciate this. So my PhD, what I was actually studying was the ways in which governments collapse in authoritarian regimes through coups and civil wars and so on. The reason I think I ended up in this field with this argument is because you read a model of why a coup happens and it's six variables and a statistical regression that shows this is significant and so on. I mean, I interviewed people and it was like, we overthrew the government because the general was very angry that the president had flirted with his wife. And you're like, okay, how do you numerically capture that in a variable? It's a personality relationship. Or my favorite was, there was a case in 1998 in Zambia, I was evaluating this coup attempt. It was a situation where they had this pretty wise idea. These mid-level officers were going to 
kidnap the army commander and force him to announce the coup at gunpoint so that it would have the veneer of sort of coming from the top. If I interviewed these soldiers. They went into his house. They tried to kidnap him. He just was a split second too quick. He was climbing over a wall. One of the soldiers I interviewed grabbed his pant leg. The army commander pulled up and the soldier pulled down and the, the army commander managed to get over the wall without being captured. And the coup failed. That really profoundly affected me when I realized that. It's the butterfly wing. Yeah, it's chaos theory. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's split seconds. It's just split seconds. That's the thing that doesn't get captured in any of these forecasts. Let me bring up another example, which I brought it up earlier. We didn't go there. I brought up the DEI. I see this right now as a butterfly wing flapping thing. So I don't know the exact way or when or how, for example, the university system in America, and a lot of corporate America has gone from, I don't think this is, I mean, gosh, I watched a Sanjay Gupta piece on CNN where he's saying essentially what I'm about to say, which is we've gone from a merit system. I mean, maybe it was never perfectly merit, but we've gone from a merit system to an identity system. So here we are now. And so you think, well, what were the forces? How did we get this to where we just had the three college presidents testifying in front of Congress? How did we get this system? It's like, well, okay, we got big funds like BlackRock. We got things like ESG. And then you got the universities at the same time going DEI. So then we go down this path for four or five, six years. I mean, it's going back longer, but it's really taken center stage in the last four or five years. And now we have conflict. And if we really drive down into the details of what the conflict is, in my humble opinion, in America in particular, it's women versus men. Because I think if we did the last election over and only women voted, Biden wins in a landslide in Electoral College, and if only men voted, Trump wins. I'm sure some people that did this had good intentions. Perhaps other people just wanted power. This notion of ESG and DEI was put into the system. It was inserted. We didn't know what was going to happen. And we're still living through it right now. We don't know what's going to happen. But there's a lot of conflict after what just happened in front of Congress. It's amazing to me how many people on the left, a lot of big fund managers in particular, are all of a sudden like waking up and going, what happened to my alma mater? What's going on here? And they're not right wing. It's fascinating where you could insert something like this into the system. And then like we're almost, we're just creating problems for ourselves that we didn't need to create. But here we are. We got to live through it. This is an area where it captures the exact same dynamics because it is the long-term historical trajectories of past injustices combined with the political action of individuals in a particular historic moment now. Some of these things, the trends that change, I'm from Minneapolis where George Floyd was killed. And of course, this is a tipping point in this debate as well. One police officer in one community changing political dynamics around race in the United States, but not just around the United States, around the world. Let me pause you for a second there. At that moment, though, and I've had this conversation on this podcast, there was a choice made, and the media did make a choice. The media made a choice that this is going to go 24 and 7, because I've said to people, people in Vietnam know about George Floyd, okay? But people don't know about, which happened, I think, early this year or late last year, the six black cops that killed a black guy in Memphis. We do get a situation where, like, yes, George Floyd, that situation went worldwide, but it was also a choice to go worldwide because we didn't have to go worldwide. It's another facet to this whole conversation. I mean, my personal view is that that was an important story. I don't really have any problem with it going worldwide. What I do think is that there are obviously choices that are made that are tied into questions about narrative and questions about framing and so on. One of the stories that I was closer to where you live, the story of the Thai cave rescue captivated the world for a week. Yeah, of course, this is the case. Of course, there are things where media narratives are shaped by individual choices that producers have. And also this taps into the ways in which we see the world through sort of this question of what makes a good story. Data and stories are not always eye to eye and so on. I think there are obviously impacts where you have individual choices at key political moments that shape narratives in ways that have profound political implications. The butterfly effect with George Floyd is one in which okay, there's a trajectory of a series of things that had to happen. What's interesting to me about that case is that it's not just the specific moment of his murder. It's also the, the moments that come well before that. There's choices about housing segregation in the United States and how he grew up and all these other things that play a role in getting us to that. Let's be frank, though. There's also his personal choices, which were not so great. He made some really bad choices. That's not a defense of anything, but he was a career criminal. I don't want to absolve his killing by the police. I'm not doing that. 
Okay, for example, to come out of the George Floyd situation, I mean, to stay in it, but to kind of pull back on it some, there's no doubt in my mind that a significant portion of America now thinks after that situation that thousands and thousands and thousands of black men are unjustly dying at the hands of white cops in America. And that's completely false. But a significant portion of America believes that. So that's why I brought up the media part. To me, that's why the media train did what it did, because it did want people that perhaps did not have the complete understanding of everything to really believe the worst of America, that what happened to George Floyd happens every day, all the time, thousands and thousands of people. And that was the message that was created. And there's a butterfly wings flapping effect once that happens. I think on the larger idea about the butterfly effect, we agree. I mean, I do think that systemic abuse by policing is a real problem in the United States with race. And I think it has been for a very long time. And there have been thousands of black men who've been killed by police. And maybe not every day over the history, there absolutely have. I think this is something where we can agree to disagree, perhaps, on the specifics of this case. I'm always just a data guy. When these things come up, you know, and look, let's be frank, it's a tough conversation to have because if you have this conversation in modern America, you run the risk, me, if I'm even saying anything that doesn't go with every aspect of a narrative, then I'm in trouble. But when you start to look at the data, for example, of police killings in America, by race, if you start to look at the homicides in America by race, okay, the data tells a story that is awful. It's awful. And so where should our attention be? Is the most pressing problem right now in America that there are rogue white cops killing black guys all the time? Or is the most pressing problem that black guys are killing black guys all the time? Again, it's the butterfly wings because nobody thinks about the second part of what I just said. They only think about the first part. And these are choices that people make. These are choices how the system happens. And again, if you play it out, if you make a different choice, maybe something different happens. I don't know. The data, I think, does show, I mean, I think we disagree on what the data shows because the black population in the U.S. is about 13% of the population and police killings by race, it's 27% of the killings are done to black people. New FBI data, 60% of homicides those committing homicides are black men. It's up to 60%. It would not be surprising necessarily that cops are having more interaction. It's actually become down to what's three to 6% of the population is doing 50% plus of the homicides in America. So it would not necessarily be surprising if police were having more interaction with people that are doing more killing. We're drifting quite far away from the ideas of what I write about. I don't know if we're necessarily drifting because ultimately it is about the idea of Whatever the narrative is, like, okay, you and I could have this disagreement right now about what the data says. We have a disagreement about what's unfolding. Either way, the butterfly is still flapping and it's still causing people to have understandings. It's still causing people to have views. Even if it's a tough conversation, it still unfolds and still creates narratives and actions and things happen. Well, that we can agree on completely. I mean, that's something where I think the way in which the George Floyd story unfolded had profound political implications. And it has profound implications that have rippled throughout both the Republican and the Democratic Party. They've had worldwide implications about questions around race and so on. There's no question. People view this differently, obviously. I think this is something where the idea, which brings us back to what we were talking about before, the idea that there is just some sterile data that's neutral, I think is wrong. I think that there is something where everything that we make sense of the world through is filtered through biases, our understanding of stories, our narratives, et cetera. I think that when you start to think about the world that way, everything seems a lot more fragile. The pandemic, which is a moment in which George Floyd was killed, that is a perfect example of this, because no matter what you think about the origins of the pandemic, it's well beyond my purview as a political scientist to know the real origins of the pandemic as it were. Whether it was in a lab leak or whether it was from a mutation at a wet market in Wuhan, either way, it's a virus that infects one person and then totally blows up the entire world. And I think that's the kind of stuff where when you start to appreciate that as taking it seriously, the modeling we had in 2019 looks ridiculous. All of it was so wrong from this one virus and this one person. You start to question, like, why don't we learn that lesson? What's also interesting, though, when you bring that up, not only is it the one person ultimately where it starts, is then it's the other decisions made by other one people that come after Every other decision that starts to happen after some stage of the game, I'm sure most people agree now in hindsight, we probably made too many counter decisions to try to 
affect the virus, which then also had unintended consequences that we're dealing with today around the world, including like I think most cities feel like a lot of the economic vitality is not necessarily returned. So it's fascinating. You get one decision, one event, there's a reaction, and then perhaps there's more reactions, more decisions, and then a compounding of all those things. Maybe the fear takes over, the mob takes over, and then and next thing you know, five years go by and you're like, what the hell happened? This is also a perfect example of radical uncertainty because anyone making those decisions at the time had no idea how it was going to play out. And they were based on extremely rudimentary models because, I mean, no one knew what the virus was. It's a great case study of trying to navigate risk and uncertainty and understanding that there are some things where you're going to make wrong calls. And I think there definitely were some calls that were made that were ridiculous in hindsight. In the UK here, it was illegal to sit on a bench outside at one point. There are things like that where you sort of in hindsight are judging it. But of course, there's also that truth, which is literally no one knew what was going to happen. No one knew at a certain moment in time, but then time moved forward and then we had a new understanding. And so there was a continuum going on here. So there was the initial moment, but then there was all these other moments that kept happening. So that's where it gets even more interesting and more complicated, frankly. Well, and also, I mean, this is one of those things where this is going to have effects on politics for years to come. If we were having this interview in 2030, I suspect that we will be able to sort of look at these fluke moments that are derived from the pandemic and the choices or mistakes that were made during it, the reverberations around the world in various anti-system politics, other aspects of this that might have effects on markets and so on. Or maybe not. Maybe people will look at it in hindsight and say, wow, what an opportunity to get more power and more money when one of these things happens. I mean, you can go either way, right? It depends on where you're looking at it from. But I think, yes, you're absolutely right. The broad point is that there's going to be very uncertain consequences that are going to really, really affect and reshape the world in ways that we can't possibly anticipate. I think this is something where you have layer upon layer upon layer of contingency. There were some calls that were right and some calls that were wrong. They are going to sway politics for a very long time. One of the ways we make sense of politics through polls, you ask people what the most important thing to them is, and you give them a few choices. I mean, there may be someone who's extremely angry on either side of the pandemic. One person who lost a loved one who thinks it wasn't harsh enough in terms of lockdowns, another person who lost their livelihood who thinks it was way too harsh, and maybe both of them end up as extremists in a political movement or whatever it is. I mean, it's just all of these things get reshaped by these uncertain dynamics. 100%. Brian, great stuff. We could go deep on many of these topics. I'm sure you can feel with me. I'd probably go down rabbit holes, whether we'd agree or disagree on some things. But the fact that we can even have the conversation in this day and age, hey, I'm all for that. Amen to that. That's right. There's probably some disagreement that we might have. Look, I enjoy pushing and I enjoy people pushing back on me. I don't care. I try to be respectful. I think you can feel that. Yep. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of that these days. Anyways, the book, Fluke. Chance, Chaos, and Why Everything We Do Matters. Brian, cool stuff. The book, Amazon, all that kind of fun stuff. Hey, is there a website you want to direct people to? Yeah, it's brianpkloss.com. You can find me on there. And I completely echo your sentiments about respectful disagreement. It's one of the most important things you can do. Yeah, absolutely. Brian, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.